Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about a little bit of the transfer portal update. The uh, portal window has officially closed for everyone that is not a grad transfer. So tons of stuff happening. Still recruitments going on, but a lot of guys have either picked where they're going or the signs are very, very clear of where they're going to end up. But we will definitely continue to unpack that, give you guys updates when needed. But let's get into Nebraska, and let's talk about this season that is ahead for them. A huge season. I apologize, my hair is a little bit all over the place right now. But um, a huge season ahead of them, and it all is because of one guy. Dylan Riola is the most important person, you could argue, in college football this year. Um, when you talk about how much one fan base is putting on one person, it'd be hard to find someone that outweighs uh, Dylan Raiola. Now, you could go to Shadur Sanders, who absolutely has a ton on his shoulders every single day. Um, you could go to a number of different teams, but Dylan Raiola is the guy that, uh, man, I can't imagine being put in this position, but he's handling it really well right now. Um, but let's jump in and kind of do this how we usually do this, go offense, defense, and then we'll go to schedule, and then kind of just get my overall thoughts on what this season could look like for the Cornhuskers. So a lot of this has to do with some of the craziness that has been going on around the Big Ten in general. There feels like there's a little bit more of an opening uh, in the college football world when it comes to the Big, Tw uh, the Big Ten in particular. You have Oregon coming in, who I think is going to be a great team, but when you look at USC, UCLA, and Washington— not necessarily the teams that they were a year ago, not necessarily the threats that um, a lot of people maybe expected them to be coming in to the Big Ten. And then you have Michigan re uh, replacing all of those guys that just found their way to the NFL. Um, so many guys that has to be replaced there. Ohio State's obviously shaping up to be a great team. Penn State is still kind of up in the air. So there's openings, um, I guess is the best way to put it, and Nebraska is a team that absolutely is going to be after one of those openings, and it all starts with this offense, right? Um, we looked at the defense last year. It was really good, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but the offense starts and almost ends with Dylan Mariola, right? He is the guy that has been pitched as the savior of uh, Nebraska football. He's the one that they want to bring them back to the top of college football. Can he handle that? He looked more than fine on Saturday, but uh, we'll find out in the fall if he can fully handle what's being put on his shoulders. Now, there's a lot of stuff in place to make that a little bit easier on him. Uh, Marcus Satterfield is his offensive coordinator, has done a great job pretty much everywhere he's been. Struggled a little bit when he was up there with the Panthers, but at the end of the day, this is a guy that can not only create really good offense, but create offense that is digestible, create offense that is dictated by the run. When you have guys like Gabe Irvin Jr. and Raheem Johnson, who both actually are coming back from injury, but once they do, they should be more than fine in that running back room. Also have Dante Dowdle, who is a uh, transfer from Oregon. So there's plenty of talent there. And Marcus Satterfield, if we know anything about him during his time at Baylor and during his time at Temple, running the ball is going to be the place where their money is made. And then you'll take your chances where they find them um, in the passing game, and you got plenty of guys to throw to in the passing game as well. Isaiah Nair, a transfer from Texas, has shown to be a very smooth route runner, a guy that can get downfield very uh, quickly and kind of unlock that arm talent that we've heard so much about. When we talk about Dylan Mariel, and we saw a little bit of it on Saturday, and then you have Jamal Banks, who I tend to believe is going to be the wide receiver one. He came over from Wake Forest, and definitely a very, very talented kid, someone that could absolutely be the go-to guy for Riola, but that doesn't end uh, the r wide receiver room by any means. There are plenty of other guys in there. Gar uh, Garcia Canst uh, Castaneda, I can never get that name out right. Uh, Malachi Coleman, and especially Jalen Lloyd, who has come on very, very strong in the spring. They have a very capable, capable group. Now, you do need some guys to step up the way that they haven't quite been asked in the past, like Isaiah Nair. But at the end of the day, very talented guys, very guys that have a ton of ability. And if Dylan Mariola can put balls the way that uh, on them the way that he was on Saturday, they won't have any struggle in this offense by any means. The O-line is the big question mark here. They really struggled with that front. Um so poorly, in fact, that they made Colorado's defensive front look dominant in that game that they played, and we found out very quickly that was not a dominant defensive front. So 
tons of stuff needs to happen there. They did bring in uh, Micah Mez- uh, Mazuka from Florida, a very talented guy at rag- right guard that absolutely will be a starter for them right away. Um, they're bringing back a lot of guys from last year, which is kind of a double-edged sword because it wasn't the best unit, obviously, but those guys could definitely have grown since then. We'll obviously find out what all of that is. Dylan Mariola does have some of that athletic ability to get out of those hairy situations, but it's not necessarily his calling card, right? One of his best things is sticking in the pocket, slinging balls out there, and doing um, the remarkable things that he can do with his arm. So I would expect um, a O-line to be very, very important to his success in the upcoming year. So as long as they're improved a little bit, can run block really well so you can you know, not face as many aggressive blitz on passing downs, I think that would be very helpful. Um, but a lot of stuff is set up. I think overall, it's a stronger group than it was a year ago by a mile. Um, pretty much every single position has been upgraded at least a little bit to help them out. Um, the running back room, getting Dante Dowdle, I think is a fantastic pickup. I think adding Isaiah Nayer and um, Jamal Banks in the wide receiver room makes you totally a uh, different group at that position. And then Dylan Mariola obviously is the biggest pickup maybe across the entire country uh, this past year when you talk about impact on their team. Um, But let's move on over to the defense and let's talk about some of the guys that you're seeing right here. That is Tommy Hill right there, one of the guys that is returning on the back end. Isaiah, Isaac Gifford, another guy. Between them, they had five interceptions, seven, uh, 17 pass breakups, tons of talent there. Um, Bly Hill is the other corner on the other side. He came in from a very small school uh, this year, but has taken a ton of steps forward in the spring, has really wowed and done uh, did some really good things in the uh, spring game for Nebraska, so that'll be really interesting to watch. But this D-line is really where everything starts. It's a very, very solid group. You have uh, Nash Hutt. Hut Macher, Hut Maker, sorry, um, Nash Hut Maker uh, and Ty Robinson, two guys that a lot of people around the program say these are NFL caliber defensive tackles. They're going to be holding down the interior defensive line, and then you have Jamari Butler coming off the edge. All guys that have been very talented in the past. Now they did lose Chief Borders to the portal which was not one they were expecting because he had an absolutely huge spring and it kind of burst onto the scene. But they still have guys behind him that can definitely help out. You have MJ Sherman, you have Princely, Princewell Uman Mielin, who is the brother of Princely Uman Mielin down there at Ole Miss. Um, so you have guys behind him that can definitely help out, but a pretty big loss there with Chief Borders finding a new place to play. Maybe they can pull him out of the portal, who knows, but uh, definitely a guy to watch as we go throughout the next little bit in the transfer portal. Um, At linebacker, the guy that is stealing the show is a freshman, uh, Vincent Shavers, who kind of had an interesting situation, was a part of the Miami class until they kept bringing in players. And uh, when you bring in players uh, to a class that can only have so many kids, some kids get cut, and that's exactly what happened to him pretty much. And he found his way to Nebraska and has been absolutely incredible. Um, Now this position group overall is a little bit tougher of a group. Stefan Thompson is another guy that could absolutely be used as a useful rotational piece there, but this is a thin group. Uh, When you talk about this defense, definitely the uh, point of attack, I suppose, for offenses is this linebacker group, but they definitely will get better throughout time, and I think Vincent, Vincent Shavers has shown just give him a little bit of time on the football field, and he'll be more than uh, more than fine. So it'll be really interesting to see that develop. This was a really good defense uh, last year, you know, 11th uh, in the country when you talk about total defense, and it was really the offense that held them back a little bit. So I'm sure they're very happy to have Dylan Mariola and all those guys coming in. I think this is going to be one of the better defenses in the Big Ten, and if you're one of the better be- defenses in the Big Ten, you're one of the better in the country. So the question is, I guess, how many of those guys will step up, how many of those guys will take that next step. MJ MJ Sherman, I think, is a hugely important person for them going forward. Um, Tons of guys that need to step up, but uh, I think this defense is going to be really, really good, really solid, not make a lot of mistakes, kind of that bend but don't break uh, mentality for them, and I think it'll benefit them greatly. Um, But let's get to their schedule and kind of break down what that looks like, because there's a lot going on here, and um, it's a relatively navigable schedule. Uh, not necessarily easy by any means, but you start with UTEP, um, that's a layup. If that's not a layup, we have a different conversation to have about Nebraska after week one. But then you get to the Colorado game, and that's going to be a huge game. Obviously a game that you lost a year ago that 
you probably should have won. Uh, anyone that watched that game, it was a, a defensive battle right after Colorado put up about a million points on TCU, and it was not what we were expecting, but it looks like uh, this year it feels like Nebraska is on a little bit better of footing. Now Colorado is as well, so I think that will be a very, very fun game, kind of similar to last year, but just more playmakers on the field, to be totally honest with you. Um, but then you have uh, Northern Iowa, you have Illinois at home, and then you go to Purdue um, before finishing this first little bit uh, off with Rutgers before you get to your first bye. All of those games are winnable. I don't think there's any question about that. They could very easily start this year 6-0, and but that Colorado game is obviously the toss-up. Also, at Purdue can get a little bit sketchy. Illinois is not necessarily the easiest opponent, so None of these are necessarily, you know, outright layups aside from UTEP and Northern Iowa, I hope. But I, I do think um, this is a, a stretch where you could see Nebraska just continue to climb up those boards and continue to have uh, wins on that record. And uh, it'll be really interesting if they get to that first bye week 6-0. and You'll hear some very, very interesting talk around Nebraska now. Are those the most impressive six wins in the world? Probably not, but at the end of the day, uh, still a lot of uh, momentum going on, going into that bye week, and then coming out of it, you have at Indiana, you have at Ohio State, two games that will be hugely important. If you can split those two, you're not going to beat Ohio State at home. If you beat Ohio State at home, Dylan Wyola should get a statue outside the stadium that night. But uh, get it, if they can beat Indiana, if they can keep that momentum rolling, um, maybe you drop one to Ohio State, that's fine. Uh, and then that UCLA game will be very interesting. You don't really know what you're getting, obviously, the first time that they're facing off as Big Ten opponents. So that will be a very interesting game to watch. UCLA, I would say, is not necessarily on the best of footing right now. So I'd lean towards Nebraska in that game right now, but tons can change before then. Before you get to your last bye, and then this last three games, in my opinion, are the ones that will define whether this team ends, you know, eight and four or nine and three or six and six or seven and five. Uh, these games are hugely important. At USC is a team logically, if you look at them uh, roster for roster, I would probably take Nebraska's roster. The question then becomes, can you handle, you know, traveling that far and handling a atmosphere you never had to be in and Maybe Miller Moss ends up being the quarterback that we saw in the bowl game and not the quarterback we saw in the spring game. Um, and maybe some of the defense uh, of the defensive struggles come along a little bit faster than you would assume for USC. So that's a very sketchy game. That's kind of a toss-up in my eyes. Um, and then Wisconsin, kind of the same thing. I'm not really sure how they kind of fit with Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin is one of the very big unknowns in college football this upcoming year. So you never really know what uh, that game's going to hold. And then at Iowa, that could be a total toss-up. Playing at Iowa is incredibly tough. That defense is going to be good. There's no question about that. That offense, hopefully, will be a little bit better than it was a year ago. So a lot of those games will you know, be able to unpack a little bit more as the season goes on. But those are three hugely important games for Nebraska, You know, either finishing it off on a great foot and going into 2025 with all this momentum and Dylan Mariola as your quarterback for the second year and all the things are going the exact way that they want them to go. But then there's that other reality where you drop those three games and you go into 2025 questioning what's going on with your program and worried about this, that, and the other. So there's a ton of variability within the schedule, but it's very doable. There is tons of uh, opportunities for them to make some noise in the schedule. I think beating Colorado would be a huge win just because of the national perception of that game and of that team. Then you get at Ohio State. I don't necessarily think you'll win that game, but that obviously gives you a massive opportunity to put your name on the map. And then you get at USC. You get at Iowa, Wisconsin. These games you know, don't necessarily seem like the sexiest games in the world when you look at them at face value, but they're going to be really uh, tightly contested and going to be the games that Nebraska, you know, has lost in the past and needs to win going forward. So it'll be really interesting to watch this all unfold. I think when you talk about this Nebraska team, there's so many different things at play, right? There's so many different um, variables and unknowns. It all starts with that guy in Dylan Raiola, obviously, because, he is the person that is going to make this team go. He's going to be the person that in the games where they lose by six points or they lose by three points, he would be the guy that would get those three or six points, right? He would be the guy that 
gives them more stability at quarterback and doesn't put their defense in bad situations and, and does the things that um, have been really lacking around Nebraska for quite some time. So it'll be really interesting to watch this unfold. I think the talent has gotten immensely better around there. Probably one of the bigger talent jumps over year to year in college football this year when you talk about where they were a year ago, especially at the quarterback position. No disrespect to Henrik Harburg, but Definitely not what you want when you're uh, running around the Big Ten up there. So having Dylan Raiola at the sticks is huge. If he can burst on the scenes, things get very, very interesting in Lincoln, Nebraska very quickly. I think this year is likely a build-up year, if I'm being totally honest. I think there will be some of those freshman mistakes that tend to happen with these quarterbacks when they first come onto the scene, especially in the Big Ten where you're facing incredibly tough uh, defenses week in and week out. So I think this will be a little bit of a build-up year. I think they're a team that could beat some teams they're not supposed to beat, but also lose to some teams they're not supposed to lose to. They could kind of have that, you know, learning how to win type of year that all these teams need to have. Um, In that rebuild, you saw it in year two under Sark in Texas where they went 8-5. and Lost some games they probably shouldn't have lost, but learned how to win, learned how to get a little bit better, and then they burst onto the scene. And it's something that has happened over and over with Matt Rule, whether it's Temple or Baylor. The third year is usually the year they break out. The second year is the build-up year, the year where you see all of the things that need to be in place, but it doesn't necessarily translate to as many wins as you could have hoped. So I think you you sit around somewhere around eight and five, seven and six, uh, maybe even nine and four type team. Um, But this team does have the chance to be even better than those second year teams under Baylor and Temple just because of the talent level and the little bit of an opening they have in the Big Ten this year. So I'm going to be watching them very closely. This is a team that I think is so fascinating because of the Dylan Raiola factor more than anything else, but also a very good defense that really just needs a little bit of help from their offense. And uh, bringing in someone like Raiola, bringing in the Dante Dowdle from in the run game and all the wide receivers they brought in, they've done everything the way that you need to do it. Now, the results on the field need to happen, but uh, the work has been done. Now it's just let the chips fall where they may for Nebraska, and it'll be really, really interesting to watch. But I gotta say, I think they're on the right path. But uh, that will do it for this edition of the GSMC College Football Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are presented by the GSMC Sports Network. Your support means a lot to us, so please remember to subscribe to the show, leave a positive review. It does make a huge difference. Also, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and more for all the content and updates. Also, I do want to send out a little PSA. I would love to start doing some segments where I take some of your questions about the offseason, some teams you're watching, whatever it is. You can throw anything you want at me, and I will, am more than happy to include it in a segment, maybe a little uh, interactive type uh, segment on here. You get to see your name on here. So drop any of the comments you want on here, any questions you could possibly need for the upcoming season, because... I think that would be a really fun segment for all of us. So definitely uh, drop any questions you have in the comments here. But thank you once again for listening, and I will see you guys tomorrow.